Every year we set new goals to change the past, try something new, do something different. But if we're honest, the new year can start to sound like a broken record. We want to lose weight, save money, get organized. We think if we can just work it harder, make it better, do it faster, we'll be stronger. But maybe we're trying to change the wrong thing because the common denominator of every part of your life is you. So what if this year wasn't about what you've done, haven't done, or will do, but rather who you are? Well, we're wrapping up this series that we've been uh, doing all through the beginning of the year through January, and today is the last day of New Year, New You. And uh, we've been saying that kind of the, the, the baseline motto through all this series has been, 2019 can be the best year of your life if it's your best year spiritually. Can we do that? Can, can we say all this together? Can we say this together? But let's do this. Let's say it in the first person. All right, ready? 2019 can be the best year of my life if it's my best year spiritually. And so we, we've given you guys some really good tools over this series to help you walk toward New Year, New You. And the first week we heard Pastor Russell, and he gave us a, a few questions. He gave us four or five questions that help us assess where we are and then where we want to be. The first question, well, the first two questions was, was who am I and whose am I? Who am I and whose am I? These are identity-related questions. Like, who am, whose am I? Well, I'm God's. I, I'm, I belong to God. I was made for Him. He was not made for me, but I was made for Him. I belong to Him. I am the offspring of the creator of the universe, which means, who am I? It means, I'm a child of God. It means I'm a child of God. So that answers those two questions. Whose am I? I'm God's. I belong to him. Who am I? I'm a child of God. And everything that God provided to Jesus, every good gift, he provides to me as well because of who Jesus is and what he accomplished. That's good news. The, the second question was that, he, that Pastor Russell gave us was, where am I? And so we asked this question to just kind of assess where are we are in our lives right now? What do we have available to us? And then we, we consider what do we need to take the next step? Which leads us to that third question. And that question is, is where is God leading me? Where is God leading me? So many of us, we're just wandering aimlessly through life and we're letting circumstances dictate to us what our priorities should be what our passion should be or what, where, we, where we devote our, our time and our money and our resources. We're just allowing the circumstances of life tell us where we're going. But honestly, we ought to just slow down and ask Holy Spirit, where are you leading me? And when you begin to get a picture of where Holy Spirit is leading you, you, you cling to that. You hang on to that. I remember uh, years and years ago, uh, a, a preacher said this once. He says, one word from God can change your life forever. One word from God can change your life forever. And I absolutely believe that to be true. When God gives you a word, you get tenacious about it. You cling to it. You hang on to it. You bite down on it like a bulldog biting down on a T-bone steak. Ain't nobody going to take that steak away from that dog. And that's how you need to be with God's word when he speaks things to your heart. You cling to them. And then the last question that Pastor Russell gave us was, how do I get there? How do I get to God's vision? So, so Holy Spirit starts revealing things to you. And then now you can intentionally start developing a plan on how to get from where you are now to where Holy Spirit wants you to be. And you just take one step at a time. You, and then you see, once you take that step, then you see just enough in front of you to take the next step. You know, the Bible says that God's word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. He didn't say it was like one of those big spotlights that they have at the airport or on the barge. It's like a lamp. You know, with those, I think sometimes we expect God to just show us way off into the distance. And every once in a while, he might do something like that. But in our everyday lives, it's like, 
Holy Spirit saying, I just want you to take the next step. I know you can't see two steps in front of you, but just take the next step. You don't have to have the whole thing figured out. Just do what you know to do today. And so that, those were great questions. And then a couple of weeks ago, we got to hear from our friend Joshua McLeod. And Joshua came and, and gave us just this really rich message. And he talked about if we want new year, new you, if we want 2019 to be the best year of our life and to, to be the best year spiritually, then we've got to open up the gifts that God has given us, right? So he led us over to, to First Peter, or excuse me, Second Peter chapter 1, and he showed us how to open up these gifts as Peter lays it all out. And it starts with faith and then virtue, then knowledge and then self-control and then steadfastness, then godliness, then brotherly affection, and then finally love. If you, if you weren't here for that message, I encourage you to go back on our website, seedschurchtn.com slash messages. Listen to that. Such a rich message. And then last week, we said that as you pursue this new year, new you, it's going to require change. It's going to require change. And here's the thing. We tend to approach change from the outside in. We tend to think, man, if I can just change all of these external circumstances, then I'll get what, what I'm looking for. But real change, lasting change, doesn't happen from the outside in. It happens from the inside out. It doesn't happen by focusing on external things. It happens by focusing on eternal things. So how do we change from the inside out? We said that if you want to change what you do, You've got to first change what you love. If you want to change what you do, you must first change what you love. Well, why can't we just focus on behavior modification? Why can't we just focus on, well, I just need to do this. I just need to do this. Because our life is driven by our desires. If we just do behavior modification, we said this last week, it's like pulling weeds in the garden. You go over there and you grab the weed and you just yank the top of that weed off and you throw it off, you throw it away, but you didn't get the root. And if you didn't get the root, then guess what? That weed's just going to grow right back up. And that's what behavior modification is like. It, you, 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 might, you might see some, some results real quickly for a short period of time, but you didn't handle the root. So if, you've got, if you want to change for real, then you've got to first change, first change what you love. If I want to change my life, if I want to align my life with the truth of God's Word that I am a new creation that old things have passed away and that all things have become new, then I've got to change what I love. We also said this last week, that our behavior, the things that we do, follows our heart, the things that we love. So now the question is, how do we change what we love, right? And I think a clue to the answer to that question is what we added to this, and that is that our behavior, what we do, follows our heart, what we love, but our heart follows what we worship. And that's kind of where we left things off last week. So I know at the end of, of last week, people were going, how do I change what I love? How do I change what I love? So it was like a little bit of cliffhanger, but that's where we're going to pick up this week. Let me, let me ask you this. If, if our behavior follows our heart and our heart follows what we worship, then what is worship? Behavior is what we do. Heart is what we love. Worship is what? It's what we place value on. It's what we ascribe worth to. That's what worship is. And we all do this. Every single one of us does this. Every single human being on the face of the planet worships in some way. They place value on things or people. They ascribe worth to things or people. And so we, we worship and we ascribe worth by the way we spend our time, by the way we spend our money, by the way we spend our resources and our energy. We ascribe worth with our thoughts and with our words. So if we put this all together, our behavior, what we do, follows our heart, what we love, and our heart follows what we worship, what we ascribe worth to. Cool thing is, is this, and it's also a frightening thing as well, because it can go one way or the other. Whatever you ascribe worth to, in your life the most, whatever you place value, the most value on in your life the most, you become like that thing or that person. You know, yesterday on Facebook, I made this 
comment that I think it came across as like real Jesus jukey. And, uh, you know, it's like, <laughs> I said, what, who's going to get your best tomorrow, God or football? You know, today, today's the Super Bowl. And you know what? I don't have anything. There's nothing wrong with the Super Bowl. I love the Super Bowl. I love football. That's great. But who's going to get my best? Who am I going to ascribe most worth to? And, and, and I don't mean, again, I don't mean that. I'm not trying to condemn, you know, football or anything like that or make anybody feel bad about that. But I just was trying to bring awareness. Somebody's going to get my best. Who is it going to be? Who am I going to ascribe the most worth to? And so whatever I worship, that's what I become most like. It, it, could, be really, it could be really encouraging or it could be frightening. As you might imagine, the Bible talks a lot about worship, right? <laughs> Duh. It talks a lot about worship, and it, it talks about uh, uh, ascribing worth. And a lot of people, they ascribed worth, they worshiped God, and God did amazing things in and through their lives. And then other people, they ascribed worth, they placed value on other things besides God. Maybe, maybe themselves, maybe fleshly desires, maybe false gods, and they made a real mess of things. I, I think one of these people, one of the, the people here in the scriptures that is a great example of both paths <laughs> is David. David the shepherd, David the giant killer, David the king. There was a time in David's life where he got his focus off of God and he began to place value on his own fleshly desires. And to say that he made a mess of things would be kind of an understatement. I mean, we're talking about lust and adultery and lying and conspiracy and murder. But if you look at all of David's life, if, and, and the wonderful thing is, is this. David, David repented. repented. David repented. Nathan, the prophet, came to him and said, bro, you're out of line. David repented. He turned and he turned back to God. And, and if we look at David's entire life, we can see really that for the most part, David really did ascribe worth to God for the most part of his life. He really did place the most value of anything on God in his life. And so he's a great example of this. And in two different places in the scriptures, 1 Samuel 13, and then also Acts 13, verse 22, this is what God says about David. He says, I have found David a man after my own heart. And I just want to say this, even though David messed up royally, even though he blew it big time, God redeemed him, God renewed him, and God restored him. And if God can say that about David, God can say that about me. That's good news. And God can say that about you. That's exciting news. God wants to redeem you. He wants to renew you, and he wants to restore you. What did it mean that, that, that David was a man after God's heart? What does that mean? It means the pursuit of David's life, his greatest goal in life, his greatest pursuit was just to know God, was just to be with God. He, he, he wasn't king so that he could just build a kingdom of his own. That wasn't his greatest pursuit. It wasn't conquest. It wasn't to make a name for himself in history. It was just, his greatest desire was to just to pursue God. And check out what God says right after he says, I found David, he, he's a man after my own heart. He says this, he will do everything I want him to do. See the pattern here? Our behavior follows our heart. And our heart follows what we worship. How many of you would say, 2019, you want to do everything that God wants you to do? Let me see your hands right now. Every, every hand's going up right now because we all want. Who, who wants to be everything that God wants them to become this year? I do. That's what I want. Yes. And, and, and so how do we do that? We do it the same way David did. We become after God's own heart. Men, you become a man after God's own heart. Ladies, you become a woman after God's own heart. Why? Because it's your heart that leads your desires, or excuse me, that leads your actions. Your desires lead your actions. Your, your, your life is driven by your desires. So the question is, how did, did David become a man after God's own heart? How did this happen? How did he fulfill everything that God wanted him to do? 
Well, if we look in Psalms, David leaves us some clues on how we can worship God, on how we can put God at the center and give God all of our affections and all of our attention. Here's what David says in Psalm 1, verse 1. He says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take. But blessed are are the ones who sit in the company, or, or excuse me, they don't sit in the company of mockers, but blessed are those who delight in the law of the Lord, who meditate on his law day and night. You know, I love Renee came up here just a minute ago and she's talking about Bible plan. She had no idea I was going to, what I was preaching this message. But what is David saying here when he says the law of the Lord? He's talking about God's word. He's talking about God's way. If you look in some other translations of this passage, it actually translates it. Translates it. The, instead of it says the law of the Lord, it says God's word. Another translation says scripture. And, and, and so what does David say about the words and the way of God? It says that he delights in them, that he takes pleasure in God's word, that he's passionate about God's word and God's way, that he, that he finds it thrilling. It's exciting. We've been saying that 2019 can be the best year of your life if it's your best year spiritually. And one of the primary ways that that we make it our best year spiritually is by taking delight in God's Word. 2019 will be the best year of your life if you delight in God's Word. Now, I understand this is not the only thing that you need. You, You need a thriving prayer life too which is why we, we prioritize and we emphasize prayer around here very much. We schedule prayer very much, and you need a thriving prayer life. And you know what else you need? You also need godly friends. You need godly friends to help you walk as a disciple of Jesus. You need community. That's why you need to be plugged into a city group. But, but it, the ones that are just launching just now. Commu- see, community is like soil, and you plant your life into the soil. If you want... Your, your life to be cultivated and grow and bear fruit. That's, that's how you have to do it. Your life has to be planted in, in soil, the soil of community. A lot of us, we have community, but we've planted our, our lives in the, the soil of community that is not rich with nutrients. The, the community that you're planted in is not helping you delight in God's word. And so that's why you need to get into Fellowship and close relationship with believers who help you delight in God's word. And city groups that we have are great places to do that. Um, <clears throat> so why is it important to delight in God's word? Why is that important? Because when you die and you get to heaven, there's going to be a crazy hard Bible quiz. <laughs> and if you don't get it right, you don't get in. course not no you need to delight in God's word because when you're at city group and everyone's standing around and they're talking about eschatology and they're talking about the Nephilim and you're you you don't have a clue what the two words I just said just now and you don't want to look stupid and that's why you need to delight in God's word no that's not why you need to delight in God's word and you will never hear me preach on the Nephilim so anyway for those of you that know what that is, you're like, yeah, good, because there's not enough to preach about it. The reason I delight in God's word is because it helps me worship God. It helps me see God. It helps me ascribe worth to God. It helps me place the right value on who God is in my life. And when I do that, when I'm worshiping God, and if I'm delighting in God's word, it's helping me worship him, it's helping me ascribe words to God, then guess what? My heart is following that. I, I understand, I, oh, I'm loving God more. And, and then guess what? Then I find that my behavior starts to follow that. What, what did we say last week? John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And like I said, I think for too many years, I've read through that scripture, and I've just been like, Focused on the obey commandments part. I want, God, I love you and obey your commandments. 
But see, that's the natural byproduct if I love God. And the natural byproduct of me worshiping is, is me loving. So what am I focused on? What am I ascribing worth to? What am I placing value on? That's why it's important to delight in God's word. Not because there's going to be a crazy hard Bible quiz. Not so that you can look smart, but it's so that you can love God. And you can understand who he is and his love. He is worthy. 2019 will be the best year of your life if you delight in Facebook. 2019 will be the best year of your life if you delight in Netflix. Next episode, right now. Man, if that were the truth, America would be in revival right now. If that were the truth, we would have the most spiritually vibrant nation on the world, in, in the entire world. The truth is, is that one of the ways that 2019 will be the best year of your life is if you delight in God's word. Listen, if we want revival in our church, if we want revival in our city, you know what we need? We need a greater revelation of God's love. We need a greater understanding of the love of God and who he is. The character and nature of who he is. He is a good father. He is holy. He is love. He is perfect in all of his ways. And if we get a greater understanding, a greater revelation of who he is and his love, then it increases our capacity to love him and to love others. And we start stoking that fiery passion in our heart for Jesus and his kingdom. And you know what? We start finding automatically, we're just loving less the things of the world and we're loving more the things of his kingdom. And one of the primary places that we get the revelation of who God is, that greater revelation of the love of God, is right here in this book. It's not the only place, but it's a primary place. You need, you need community. You need community because what Renee was talking about, man, you, don't, you can read this sometimes and you don't have understanding. You can get out of whack and you need community. You need to be in, in a strong group of believers that can help you go, no, 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 wait a second. Uh, here's the context, yeah. you know, right? So it's important. This is one of the primary places we get to know God and understand God. Why should I delight in God's word? Because it's one of the places where I find him. That's where he, it's not the only place where he is, but it's one of the places that I can go every single day and find him. Right. So real quickly, in the last few moments here, I want to share with you our, our, an extremely important, but also very practical way to approach God's word. And, and I could share, we could just rattle off five different things. And they're all good and they're all things that you need. But I, I want to focus on this one thing that I believe is probably the most important thing as you approach God's word. And that's this. Read for relationship first. Read for relationship first and foremost. When you pick up your Bible, let the foundational motive of when you open up the scriptures is that you are there to meet with God that you're there to better your relationship with him. And, and you, you might hear this and you go, duh, duh, JD, everybody knows that. That's so simple. What, what are you doing? You're coming up here and, you know, how do we even, how, how are you even the pastor of this church saying such simple stuff? Listen, <laughs> you might know this. You might know that you, well, yeah, of course I'm supposed to re read for a relationship. But you know what? We have not trained our minds. We have not trained our hearts to do this. We have trained our hearts and minds to go to God's Word first out of obligation, I think. Or guilt. We go there because we just, we feel like that's what we're supposed to do. You know, you, you want to be a good Christian. And you know other good Christians and they read their Bible. So you know what? I'm, I guess I'll read my Bible. And so you pick up your, your Bible and, and, and you read for a few minutes or however long it is that it takes for you to feel like you've met your obligation. 
and then you put it down, but you've not really increased your relationship with the Lord because you're not there for relationship, you're there for obligation. I'm not saying that if you read for obligation that your, your time is completely wasted. But it definitely is not as good as if you went there, if you went to God's Word for relationship. Another way that we have trained ourselves to read God's Word and to go to God's Word is for application. An application is good, but it's not primary. It's secondary. And so this, this almost feels counterintuitive because application is... is a concept that's so rooted in our culture, not just in the church, yes, in the church, but just throughout the Western culture in general. Instead of reading for relationship, we're, we're reading God's Word for its usefulness. We're looking just to apply principles to our lives. Now listen, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong to, with, with, with applying God's Word to your life. You absolutely should do that. You should be going, well... This is what the scriptures instruct me to do. I should do that. But remember, remember, hearts first. Actions will follow the heart. And, and, and so we're, we're, we're going to God for, the, we're going to the, to the book for usefulness. And it is important. Usefulness is important. Um, James 1.22 says, Be doers of God's word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So we need to do God's word. We need to do it. Uh, we need to have a biblical worldview. We need to allow the scriptures to shape the way that we think, to shape the way that we live. But application is not the deepest reason to go to God's Word. Because what happens if I go and I start reading, and I'm reading here and I, I don't find anything particularly insightful. I don't, I'm not finding anything particularly helpful or applicable to my life today. So what am I going to do? Oh, I'm just going to stop reading. Why? Because why should I read something that's not useful to me? See, our, our culture has trained us to focus on usefulness and convenience and not relationship. I mean, just think, think about for a moment how just even the business world used to be just a few decades ago. We would do business with people that we knew that we were in a relationship with us, even though it may have cost us a little bit more because we valued relationship more than we valued usefulness or convenience. I mean, I was just telling uh, Russell this morning, they, they built a new car wash on the backside of my neighborhood. And I've got another car wash that I go to often. It's, right, it's like right around the corner from my house. It's boom. It's right there. And I go to it all the time, keep my car clean. Well, guess what? I decided I'm going to try out the other car wash. <coughs> so I'd go through the car wash this, uh, this last week, the new one. It's the exact same price, but guess what? It does a better job. So even though I've been going to this other car wash for almost two years, I've now decided, you know what? This other place, it's more useful. I'm going to go over here. That's our culture. But the, the culture of the kingdom is not like that. The culture of the kingdom says, we value relationship over usefulness. We value relationship over convenience. The problem with going to God's word out of obligation or just going to it for application, both of these approaches put me at the center. I'm at the center and now I'm trying to get God's word to orbit around my life. And I've made it all about me. And what I've done is I've tried to take the scriptures, to take the truth of God's word, and fit it into the context of my life. So then, now that means there's parts of the Bible I won't read. <laughs> because that doesn't fit into the context of my life. But instead, I should be looking to find my life and put my life into the context of God's word. So there's a deeper reason to go to God's Word than obligation. There's a better approach to God's Word than just reading for application. Instead, I want to read for relationship. I want to read for relationship. I'm going to go to God's Word because I want to cultivate my relationship with God. That's what David did. 
he delighted in God's word. And the byproduct of that was that he became a man after God's own heart. He approached God's word saying, God, I want to know you. I want to understand you more. I want to love you more. I want to learn, God, who you are. Men, those of us that are married in here, I would gather to say that most of us probably got our wives with this method. (laughs) I mean, I know for me, I pursued Jamie. I pursued her. I'd find out, where is she going to be? And that's where I would go. What is she up to? What is she doing? That's what I would do. I know there's a legal term for that. (laughs) That you could get a restraining order against you, but if that lady doesn't like you showing up and doing all the things that... but, But listen, I didn't have like... I didn't have like the cool pickup lines. I didn't know the right things to say. I just knew that I wanted to be around her. I just knew that I wanted to spend as much time around her as I possibly could. What if we approach God the same way? What if we approach His Word the same way? God, I'm not here because I have to be. God, I'm not here because I just want you to download to me the answer to all my problems. God, I'm just here because you're here. God, I'm here because I'm just pursuing you. If you start approaching God like this, if you start delighting in His Word, if you start taking pleasure in it, if you decide to start stirring up your passion for God by delighting in His Word, then you're going to find yourself automatically becoming a man after God's own heart, becoming a woman after God's own heart. And when you find yourself, when you find that you're becoming a person after God's own heart, then you're on your way to having the best year spiritually. And then you're on your way to 2019 being the best year of your life. And then guess what? doesn't have to stop there. Like we said, 2020 can be even better than 2021 can be even better. 2019, making this declaration, 2019 will be the best year of my life because it will be my best year spiritually. If you want that, I want to invite you to stand with me right now. And I want us to make this declaration, the same declaration, out loud together. Let's say it. 2019 will be the best year of my life because it will be my best year spiritually. Now let's say it again. Let's say it with conviction. Let's say it with confidence. Let's say it with authority that, listen, this year is going to be the best year of my life because it will be my best year spiritually because I'm going after God. It's not about what I do, but it's about what I love. It's about what I worship. It's about what I place value and, and, and ascribe worth to. Let's say it again. 2019 will be the best year of my life because it will be best year spiritually. Let's pray. Father, mm, help us seek your face and not just your hand. Help us come to you and to know you and not just know what you can do for us. God, we want to love you more. We want to know you more, God. We know that you are real. We know that you're real, but we ask you to increase our awareness of your realness. Increase our awareness of your presence. Increase our awareness of your greatness. And give us a a greater revelation of who you are. Give us a greater revelation of your love. And God, we know that the natural byproduct will be that we will love you more. Our capacity for love will increase for you and increase for people. And God, we will obey your commands. Father, thank you so much for revealing yourself to us through your word. God, you didn't have to do that. You could have kept us in the dark and we would have been blind and hopeless, but that's not what you did. You revealed yourself to us through the scriptures and then you didn't stop there because God, you became flesh and blood and the word became flesh and it came and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus. And so Jesus, we thank you right now for doing that. We thank you right now that 
Through your life, we have seen the grace of God. We've seen the truth of God. And I just pray right now for every single person in this theater. I pray for every single person that's watching or listening online. And Lord, I just pray right now that Jesus, that your grace and truth would be evident to us all. Help us delight in your word, God. Help us delight in your words so that we can better know you. We love you, God. If you're here today, and you say, you know what, I'm not following Jesus. Maybe you feel like, man, I've been trying to do things my way. I've made a mess of my life like David. Or maybe things, maybe the circumstances of, it, circumstances of your life are pretty good, but there's still something on the inside of you. So there's this void. Holy Spirit is talking to you right now. God's Holy Spirit is calling you to come and be a disciple of Jesus, to give your life to Him. And if you want to do that today, it starts with a decision. We're, we're, I want to invite you to pray with me, but it, it's not that, oh, you pray this prayer and then just all of a sudden, like, you know, God sprinkles fairy dust over your life and then, you know, all of your problems go away. That's not the promise of the gospel. The promise is, is that as we follow Christ, we can find the strength to overcome anything. That's the promise. And we're not going to God again just for, God, what can I get from you? We're not going to just seek His hand to seek usefulness, but we're going because He's the Creator. He's your Creator. He made you. Why would you not want to know Him? He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. It doesn't matter if you've done like David and you, if you've, you've lusted in your heart, if you've been an adulterer. It doesn't matter if you've lied or had conspiracy or murder. God still loves you. God still loves you. And so what is, what is the correct response for our hearts to return that love back to Him? Say, Jesus, I will follow you. So if you want to do that today, I just want to invite you to pray with me. We call this the believer's prayer. Because you might be a sinner today, but after you pray and you believe in your heart, then you're no longer a sinner, you're a believer. So you can just join me in your heart. and You can just pray right there where you're sitting. Heavenly Father, I come to you now and I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess that, that I have made a mess of my life, God. And even though if some, if some of us, God, if, if my life is going good right now, the circumstances, God, I still feel this, this void and I feel this tugging and God, I want to give my life to you. And so I come to you now and I just ask you to clean me, to make me white as snow, to make me righteous. Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. Jesus, I believe that God raised you from the dead. And I give my life to follow you. I give my life to follow you. So come and make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me make a difference with my life. I want to know you more. I want to love you. Give me a greater revelation of your love for me. So I can better love you. In Jesus' name. Amen.